It's our Lions special with uh, Neil Tracy. Neil, you've picked the entire squad for us. Oh, I have. And I sincerely regret suggesting I would do it as well because <laughs> it got to a stage last night I had sat down. Oh, the, the level of organisation here. What I did was, I'll show you some of them. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try block out some of the names before I reveal them. But for example, I have cue cards all over the place here. Right. I've got a, I've got a cue card for each position. So I knew that, okay, loose head prop. I wrote down all the, all the loose head prop contenders down there. I know I have to take three of them and jot down as well maybe a couple of plus ones and plus twos for, for late call-ups along the way if people get injured. But it got to a point I had 35 of my 36 names and I sat looking at the second row cue card and looking at the last two names for probably 20 minutes before I eventually settled on one. And it was probably a copper, to be honest. I took I took the safe option. Uh, I'll reveal that when we get to it. But what? yeah. What so your... much pre so much pressure, I can't imagine what poor Warren Gatland is going through. What, what was your criteria when it came to selecting, you know, was it like they're going to be good around the place, they're going to be, what was it, they're going to be able to deal with the peculiar requirements of COVID and the bubble in South Africa? How did you, how did you lean? What was it, game plan, game style, Warren Ball? Well, I wasn't looking for characters anyway. Like, I, I wasn't going like, all right, okay, we got to bring him. He's going to be social secretary and he's going to be top of the bus telling the jokes every morning on the way to training. No, basically what it was, you want, as well as quality, you want a lot of versatility. Up front, I wanted really, really good scrummagers because I think that's where you have to take on South Africa. You you want big, big, powerful forwards. Um, and I think that's what I've gone for. Decent bit of experience along the way then as well. A couple of, couple of younger guys... Uh, who are bolters, although they've been well marked from from a decent way out. But yeah, ultimately you want a lot of versatility because it's only a 36-man squad, uh, which is lowest squad number since two, since 1997. Uh, I remember looking, I have it here, it was a 37-man squad in 2001, 2009 and 2013. 41 went to New Zealand in 2017. And then you had that ludicrous 44-man squad that... Clive Woodward brought to New Zealand back in 2005 when he decided to just basically pick every fit and available player playing in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but yeah, 36 is a very, very low uh, low number of players for a tour of this, uh, of this magnitude. So you want a lot of players that can kind of multiply into a couple of different positions and cover you in that way. Okay. Um, did you include all those players who kind of went to the last Lions tour but didn't? Did they all end up getting Lions caps or were they official Lions? You know, the ones who were just holidaying on an island very close by and then all of a sudden flew in and was like, oh, look at these guys, they're all Lions all of a sudden. I mean, I don't know. Um, Will there be a bit of that going on this time? There can't, can there? As in, like, did I count that as Lions experience when I was picking it? Well, uh, just uh, in the numbers that you've tallied there, like... The 41. Oh no, for, for, for the forty-one for New Zealand. That was like the, that was the official squad squad that was named. Right. Okay. Okay. On, um, you know, whatever, eight weeks or six weeks out okay. from the from the tour. This, okay. So that actually bloated a bit more after that as well. Right. Let's mm. get into it. Okay. So uh, loose heads. Will we fly through these, or do you want to do me the the, the national jingoistic breakdown first? <laughs> I'll read it out. Wynne Jones, Wales. <laughs> no. um, so yeah, uh, three loose head props. This was a Wynne Jones and Rory Sutherland. I thought were absolute bankers to make it. So Wynne Jones from Wales, Rory Sutherland of Scotland, and then I was I was pretty torn actually for a good while between Keen Healy and Ellis Genge, and just about fell on the side of Keen Healy um, for overall experience and I think his scrummaging form over the last few months. Ireland had an excellent scrum in the Six Nations. England did not. Keen Healy was a big part of that. He was playing excellent rugby. I know he's 33 years of age and getting on a bit, but um, I think he's just about just about edging it for me. Ellis Genge probably wasn't probably came back into contention, I think, with his performance for Leicester Tigers against Ulster at the weekend. He was absolutely brilliant with ball in hand, around the park, making tackles, everything. But I just think Keane Healy's solidity at scrum time snuck it for me. Uh, whichever one of those three is going to be starting in a test match, I haven't a clue, though, because it is very, very close between all of them. And even on Rory Sutherland, he would actually be a bit of a doubt to make it on the Lions tour at the moment. He's got a pretty bad shoulder injury and it's touch and go whether he would be available to to make his return in time for that uh, that warm-up game against Japan in Murrayfield in July. So 
if, for example, Rory Sutherland doesn't make it, Ellis Gange would be next cab off the ranks straight away. OK. Uh, you've gone for three loose heads, three hookers and three tight heads. Who are your three hookers? Three hookers are, again, the first two of them I thought were pretty easy to choose. And then I was kind of, I was humming and hawing on the last one and ultimately sided with an Irish person because I'm biased and I, ha- I hate your, I hate your favourite player. That's what I need to tell everyone. Just <laughs> just get that out of the way before they can accuse me. But yeah, I went for uh, Ken Owens of Wales. That was a pretty, pretty easy choice. Jamie George as well, I think was a, a pretty easy choice. And then I just about sided for Ronan Kelleher over Luke Cowan-Dickey. Like, in part, I would say it's because of that. You know, it's a, it's an unco- a subconscious thing where I have seen a lot more Ronan Kelleher than I have of Luke Cowan Dickey, and I think that's understandable. But I think particularly with Kelleher over the last couple of months, I know he only started one game for Ireland in the Six Nations, but he's an explosive player. He's a power player, and I think he's exactly the type of player that you would need down in South Africa where you're going to be taking on a huge, huge pack of forwards. I think his line-out throwing has come on. And he's an excellent scrummager as a hooker as well. So Kelleher just about getting the nod for me then at hooker alongside Jamie George and Ken Owens with uh, Luke Cowan Dickey, uh, the next man up if there was to be an injury or suspension. I would possibly be siding just about Ken Owens though for for a starting test place if uh, if there was a gun to my head. Okay, at tight head? Tight head, again, the first two were absolutely simple. Tyg Furlong and Kyle, Kyle Sinclair. I don't think you're going to see many people's squads around the world that don't include the two of those fellas. And then it pretty much came down to to Andrew Porter, Thomas Francis or Xander Fagerson. And again, I just went for Porter. But look, as you know, I've been talking about Andrew Porter for a long time on, on the tight five. I've always been a big fan of him. Thomas Francis, it has to be said, had an excellent Six Nations for Wales. And he's really, really improved his game around the park as well, where he's getting on the ball a lot more. He was brilliant for them throughout the campaign. Uh, Xander Fagerson, that Xander Fagerson was m- maybe just about a level below, but I would still have him as a plus two if either one of Porter or Francis got uh, got injured. I do. I am a big fan of Andrew Porter, and I think we know Porter as well. He does have the option of versatility. I know we're bringing three loose heads as well, but. If push came to shove, you could be you could be able to play Andrew Porter as a loose head at some point during the uh, during the comp during the during the tour. Do we think Gatland is going to park his Welsh uh, love, whatever that whatever the appropriate word is, and and love in these fifty fifty calls, not side with the team, he's going to have to go back and coach because he doesn't have to go back and coach them anymore. Uh, yeah, look, like to be honest, I I think some of the ones I've picked here, I would say when it comes down to the hookers. I would probably say, it, like this is what I am. I'm choosing for for you know the Lions team I'd pick, but like I would probably say I'm probably expecting to see Luke Cowan Dickey, for example, going ahead of Ronan Keller. Um, at tight head, I I think it absolutely is borderline toss of a coin between Porter and Thomas Francis. Right. But ha- yeah, as you kind of said, like you know Warren Gatlin is going to know Thomas Francis a lot better than he knows Andrew Porter. Having said all that, then as well, you got someone like Robin McBride who's in the committee meetings as well, saying mm. he's probably talking up Andrew Porter to go alongside Todd Furlong as well. Mm, OK. Second row, Alan Wynne jones nailed on, right? Maro Toje, nailed on. After that, yeah. where are we going? Two, two of them absolutely nailed on, and it looks like Alan Wynne jones is going to be captain as well. Uh, after that, to be honest, I thought Ian Henderson nailed on. I was pretty happy to make that selection, and then it pretty much came down to James Ryan or Johnny Gray. And this was the one I mentioned a few minutes ago where, honest to God, I spent 15, 20 minutes just staring at this one last card with Johnny Gray written down alongside James Ryan, and I could not split them. Um, That'll be really so, disappointing for James Ryan if he doesn't make this squad, Neil, won't it? Like, I mean, the way we would have spoken about him over the last few years, like uh, Sexton, Furlong, James Ryan as, as the three players in their position who, who would get into to most teams in the world. It would, and look, to be honest, up until this time last year, he he definitely would have been nailed on, I'd say, in in, in most Lions squads. But look, he's had a difficult season. He had a he had a bad shoulder injury that kept him out for a while and kind of disjointed his return to play when rugby did return. And then he went through, obviously, the he was stood down for a short while uh, after a couple of uh, failed head, uh, HIAs during games in the Six Nations. So he's kind of had that, there's been a bit of scattered been a bit of scattered time off throughout the season which is you know probably disjointed his campaign ever so slightly as well i do i do think johnny gray is an absolutely fantastic player he's big and he's physical and he is 
as good a tackler as there is in the world. Um, his, his, ta- his tackling stats are just sensational. He's consistently hitting 98, 99%. I think he's missed about five tackles in all competitions in the last decade or something like that. Uh, he's an absolutely brilliant player. I just about, just about sided with James Ryan. And it's probably for the reason that I sided for Andrew Porter and for Ronan Keller and the likes is that I just, I have seen more of them than I have of Johnny Gray. And I know people are going to say, oh, well, you know, isn't it your job to be watching lots of leagues around the world? And yeah, I do. I watch plenty of it. But at the same time, you know, you are just naturally going to be seeing more of the of the Pro 14 than you are maybe of the Premiership or, or the Top 14. We got it, Neil. It's it's a Leinster loving. Yeah, so yeah. far so far anyway. Uh, yeah. Let's let's keep going, horsing through this back row. Uh, a, a strong Irish flavour here. You got uh, Tygburn is is on your and you think will be on the plane as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and like for one because of his form over the last 12 months which has been absolutely brilliant but also as well he's able to cover second row and back row as well which is obviously important um but to be honest you could pick any well i did four second rows so i'm picking seven back rows you could pick any seven pretty much of the list that's down in front of me and you're going to get a pretty solid bunch so like this is the area that you're probably going to see a lot of controversy with the oh why wasn't whoever selected uh, i can't believe this guy wasn't selected so i've gone with tyke burn and CJ Stander is the two Irish players. I've gone for Tom Curry as the sole Englishman, Hamish Watson uh, from Scotland, and then I've got three Welshmen, Josh Navidi, Tolupe Falatau, and Justin Tipperick. Um, I don't think you can argue against any one of those players getting selected. The argument probably comes with who you haven't selected. So for the likes of Sam Underhill, Billy Vunapola, Van der Fleer, Jamie Ritchie, Matt Fagerson, Sam Simmons, Ross Moriarty, Jack Conan, Alex Dombrandt. Like, there's so many unbelievable back rows out there that they have an embarrassment of riches. And even if I was looking back at, you know, who would who would come in if whoever got injured, you're probably breaking it down again to to the various positions. For example, if Ty Byrne got injured, I'd probably actually be more inclined to go back and bring in a second row because Byrne kind of was covering both of those and you do have a lot of options elsewhere. If... Tolupe Falatau got injured or if CJ Stander got injured, they're kind of carrying the can at number eight a little bit. So I might be inclined to pick Sam Simmons. Whereas if Josh Navidi or if Hamish Watson went down with a with a knock, you might pick someone like Sam Underhill or Josh van der Fleer. So I don't think there's a straight who is the next man up. I think it's very much dependent on who kind of picks up knocks along the way. But yeah, I, I, I can't really see how you can argue against any one of these players being selected, uh, particularly like Tyg Byrne, it was unbelievable in the Six Nations. Hamish Watson, Six Nations player of the tournament. And I just think there's a good balance there of guys that can play blindside, like Byrne, Stander, uh, Byrne, Stander, sorry, uh, who else as well? Tom Curry can go in there. Number eight, you've got Stander, you've got Faletau, Tom Curry can play in there, and Navidi at a push as well. And then open sides as well, Watson, Tipperick, uh, Curry, and Navidi can all cover across there as well. So you've got players that can slot across all the various area, various elements of the back row. OK, that's Chrome Half. Not that controversial, is it? No, and to be honest, like I think once Ben Youngs took his name out of contention, it pretty much opened it opened up a space. Um, it's one of those, it is very open as well, but probably it just isn't going to be controversial because there isn't any kind of like absolute, you know, unbelievable candidate in there. In the end, I've gone for Conor Murray, Gareth Davies, and Ali Price. I think with Wales, you could have picked, realistically, you could have picked either one of Thomas Williams or Gareth Davies. Uh, they both had very, very good seasons. Uh, in the end, I just about went with Davies. Thomas Williams would be the next man up for me. Uh, Danny Kerr then after that probably has come into contention in the last couple of months as well. I, I'd probably go with him after Thomas Williams if there were injuries. But yeah, it's, it's not a particularly controversial position at the moment. I think Conor Murray's probably the favourite at the moment anyway when it comes to a test shirt. Out half, this is where the controversy begins. Give me your top four here. Only three on your plane. Yeah, my top four. So the three that I picked were Owen Farrell, George Ford and Finn Russell and next man up, Daniel Bigger of Wales. England, England, Scotland and Wales in your top four. Rounding out your power rankings, is it is it... Uh, uh, Why do you hate Ireland so much, Neil? Is it 
Is it and Joey Carby number five? Only... <laughs> is it? Uh... Um, after Dan Bigger, to be honest, I'm I probably have Marcus Smith. No Sexton at all. Yeah, look, look, I think N not even near your selection. I would have you'd have worries about how many games in a row Sexton can play these days. Like at the end of the Six Nations, he had the he had the HIA during the Six Nations. He had another one in the game against Munster the week afterwards, and then against Exeter as well. And obviously, he's been stood down ever since. He hasn't played a game. When you got these games in the Lions tour, the games are coming thick and fast. Like, unfortunately, you can't really be allowing someone to manage their minutes over the course of the couple of months. If you need them to play, you need them to play. And to be honest, I just don't really have too much faith in being able to put Johnny Sexton out week after week, uh, particularly for his own sake as well, when you see the number of injuries that he picks up. Um, and I think when it comes to Ireland, I think the risk is taken because he is desperately needed for Ireland because we don't have the options otherwise. But when you're picking the best players from across Great Britain and Ireland, like you have Owen Farrell, you have George Ford, Dan Bigger, Finn Russell, there are countless options that can go in there comfortably and you can rely on them to play week in and week out. And unfortunately at the moment, you, you can't do that with Johnny Sexton. And look, that's just the reality of it. Is he, is he number six at least? Yeah, look, he, he probably is number six. We'll give, we'll give him that. <laughs> it, it, I mean, when you're, when you're on a tour like this, you don't need him to play week in, week out. You need him to be coming off the bench to seal the game with 15 minutes left to go. So you can baby him along and you've got plenty of time. Is there, is there no part of you thinking that way? If you're bringing a 41-man squad, I think you can do that. I don't think you can do that if you're bringing a 36-man squad. Right. Because if, if, if you're giving Johnny Sexton a few weeks off here or there, you're relying on two other players to be playing every single game. Uh, yeah, I suppose. Uh, maybe you can... I, don't, look, I, I, just, I just don't think this is a tour you can carry players on, to be, to be honest. Maybe Stuart Hogg can play at 10 for a game, or you know, maybe one of those midweek games, you play one of your scrum halves at 10, and you're like, look, in history, anything that is remembered from this tour will happen on the three Saturday evenings at five o'clock when the tests are happening. And if I, if I need Johnny Sexton to come on and kick a penalty with five minutes left to go in the final of those three, it's probably worth it. Well, well like, here's the thing, uh, Neil. So if you had the choice between Finn Russell and Johnny Sexton in a one-off test against the Springboks, who are you picking? I'm picking Johnny Sexton. But there you go. Like, is that not the, what Gatlin's going to be thinking about, that he'll get his one test out of him, that he won't be his number one uh, out half anyway? Owen Farrell might well be ahead of him on the pecking order if everybody's fully fit and is guaranteed to be fit, that you're only carrying him for that one test that you want to get 60 minutes out of him for? I'm not sure. I, I think he's going to be factoring in as well the fact that he has other players who are perfectly viable test starters to go along with it as well. And look, I, I think when it comes to Finn Russell as well, obviously having Gregor Townsend there to bat for him as well is going to be huge. Um, but yeah, I, I just think it's a risk he doesn't need to take. Interesting. It'll be interesting to see if, uh, if Warren G agrees with you. Uh, the centres. Centres. I've put my Irish hat back on and my Irish jersey. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> So like, oh, the tension, the tension. But yeah, no, I've picked four centres. have gone Robbie Henshaw, Gary Ringrose, Jonathan Davies and Henry Slade. Manu Tuilangi then is the next man up if if he's able to show he's fit enough over the next kind of few weeks. Unfortunately, you see, he's been out injured since August with a really bad Achilles injury. There had been hope that he'd be able to get a game or two in before the Lions squad would have been announced. That didn't come to pass. So unfortunately... If he is going to be proving his fitness, he's going to be probably going to have to be doing it after a squad is announced, um, uh, after the squad is announced tomorrow and over the next few weeks as well. I would be more than happy if he was able to put in a couple of good games between now and the end of the season, have him definitely as the next man in to, to step up. If not, I might actually go with uh, Chris Harris, who's a Scotland and Gloucester centre. I thought he's been absolutely brilliant this season and has just looked really versatile, comfortable on the ball, good in defence. But... I think this was this was uh, aside from whether or not it was Ringrose or Tuilangi, this was a reason enough, uh, reasonably easy enough selection to make. I think Robbie Henshaw has been absolutely nailed on for months now. He's been absolutely outstanding. Jonathan Davies is was probably always going to be there as well if he was fit. And Henry Slade, I just love Henry Slade. I think he's 
he's a brilliant kicking option as well that uh, that teams have. And to be honest as well, if push came to shove and you needed to to throw someone out for a midweek game at out half, he'd probably be able to do a do a shift at number ten as well as okay. well as Stuart Hogg. Okay, uh, so that's the centres. The back three. We've got four minutes left here, so let's get through these because we might actually get finished. <laughs> on this time. was actually this was actually another really really difficult one. Uh, so I was picking six back three players, and like the tricky thing is trying to find a combination of guys who can play both wing and full back because you don't want to be picking six natural wingers and having you know only or five natural wingers and only having Stuart Hogg who was going to be nailed on. But look, yeah, I went for Stuart Hogg. I went for a few Welsh guys: Louis uh, Louis Rees, Samus, Liam Williams, and Josh Adams. And then I went for two English players, Johnny May and Anthony Watson, with uh, Keith Earls, the next man up, if there was to be an injury. Duhan van der Merva, possibly after that. And I'd probably go Simon Zebo then after that. It's an area where you can see a lot of call-ups, in fairness. Yeah. Can you go Keenan not affecting things there? Yeah, like, he's... The thing with Keane, he's absolutely he's absolutely solid. He, he like the the great thing about him is he does not make mistakes. I'm I'm still waiting to see a little bit more from him in attack, and that might sound a little bit greedy because he's he's been so good since he came in. But like, I don't think you can argue against the experience. Like Stuart Hogg was always going to be there, and if you're talking about fullbacks as well, Stuart Hogg absolutely nailed on. Liam Williams has bundles of experience. He's absolutely brilliant, and also as well. In the last few months, he showed up at Wales once he got back into the team after his suspension. His form was bang on as well. Plus, he's an equally viable candidate on the wing as full-back as well. Josh Adams and Lewis Rees Samet, I think they select themselves because of their form. They're just natural try scorers. Johnny May and Anthony Watson, it's hard to overlook them as well. Um, there's just so many really, really good options there in the in the back three. We're going to note this time tomorrow whether or not Warren Gatland agrees with uh, your selections or which bits he disagrees with. Uh, Neil, good stuff. RIP your mentions, by the way. The Leinster yeah. militia are already, I'd say, busying themselves with their attacks. I'm going on private. <laughs> good stuff, Neil. Thanks for that. Neil Tracy uh, with this week's version of the Type 5, which was obviously a uh, Type 36.